uh, Katie Moore, I saved uh, bevacizumab for you because we, you know, you, you did a lot of these PARP studies. Is there still a role for bevacizumab in, in, in recurrent ovarian cancer? And if so, tell us about that opportunity. I absolutely think there's still a role for bevacizumab in recurrent disease. We know, um, because we actually have uh, randomized phase three data, that bevacizumab is still as effective, in fact, even if you've had prior bevacizumab. Mm -hmm. Even if you've uh, had a patient who has recurred during prior bevacizumab, if they um, are put back on it with chemotherapy and bevacizumab to follow, the, the benefit remains. So Bev after Bev uh, has been uh, has been demonstrated. Where we are now, and I think the new indications will inform some of the opportunities for BEV, but quite a few more women will be eligible, thankfully, for PARP inhibitor in the front line. And so you guys just nicely reviewed uh, SOLO2, uh, Aerial 3, and NOVA, which were all done in PARP-naive women. So now we are going to have a lot of these patients who are PARP pretreated and may have progressed in a PARP. We don't have data yet on the efficacy of PARP after PARP. And so BEV, where we do have that uh, data, and a lot of them won't have gotten BEV in the front line, I think BEV, the role of BEV actually comes roaring back uh, now uh, in this line of, of therapy. And so the nice thing is that it's been so well studied. The original study, uh, 218 and Oceans, you know, kind of limited us to carboplatin paclitaxel and carboplatin gemcitabine, which are both nice backbones. But now we have uh, data out of the AGO uh, with uh, carboplatin and pegylated liposomal doxorubicin, which is just kind of my favorite regimen just because of the schedule. It's so nice for patients. Showing that bevacizumab added to that is not only safe, uh, but is a, at least equivalent to carbogenbev and maybe a smidgen better. So you have now three backbones um, you know, in, in a platinum sensitive population in which you can use bevacizumab. So uh, I think the role of bevacizumab in this line of therapy probably went down a little bit with the PARP approvals, but now that PARPs have moved frontline, I think bevacizumab is actually going to have a resurgence here. Yeah, and it, you know, I, my goal, because I'm like, you guys, I like maintenance and I like targeted therapy, is to have every patient have an opportunity to get BEV and PARP and maybe even together. But, it, and, and how do I do that? I, I work under the umbrella of the labels because that informs reimbursement. There are, Tom Herzog, some rare instances though, where I'll see a patient who has a platinum sensitive relapse, again, PARP naive, BEV naive, even though bevacizumab works after bevacizumab, how do you make that decision in the platinum sensitive relapse, in the you know targeted therapy naive, bev versus PARP? Yeah, I think that's difficult. Um, it, you know, I think I think this is a uh, quickly changing landscape too, because uh, while we see 40, 50 percent of the patients getting bev frontline, so there's a decent chance they may not have received bev there's going to be less, less of a chance perhaps in the near future right. where they won't have received a PARP. So that could reverse things a little bit. And I may be more inclined then to go with BEV if they haven't had BEV. And also for me, I've always looked at whether they have pleural effusion, ascites, anything like that. I think BEV does a, a terrific job on those patients. And I'm, I'm always anxious to put those patients on. You then turn the corners on that. If they're naive, you also have that window of opportunity hypothesis, right? So it's the only time that you can use a PARP on these patients because That's as you right. go down the line of treatment, you won't be able to do that. And so I look at that opportunity as well. And, and, and I look at what that might mean in terms of a lost opportunity, because I can always bring BEV in. We know from the Aurelia data how wonderful BEV works in the platinum resistance study is, is, or study, is setting as well. So you always have the opportunity for BEV. You don't always have the opportunity for PARP, especially if they don't have a germline or somatic mutation. Yeah, Sharon and, and Tom Kreback, does that resonate with you that if you have a platinum sensitive patient that's responding, uh, really that may be the only opportunity for PARP unless they have a molecular signature. So you should capitalize it because they might be an exceptional responder. It's true. No, Tom? Yeah, no, I... Um, 
I love Bevacizumab and uh, platinum sensor recurrence. Um, again, um, sometimes I get off the, 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 the highway and kind of venture into the weeds, but uh, I agree with Katie. I like carbodoxal uh, Q4 weeks, Bev Q2 weeks. You increase your response rate. You get a try to get a complete response and then, and then switch them on over to a, a PARP uh, at that point and then try to see how long that they'll last on the PARP. Again, I'll try to do HRD testing at times just to – let me see where I may, uh, how long that, that, that part uh, duration may be. But um, I, I've done that quite commonly where, where um, I, I love, you know, carbodoxal Q4 weeks, uh, Bev Q2 weeks, try to get a complete response or get the best response after six to eight courses and then switch them over to PARP. Yeah, thank you for that. And it's not just the schedule, it's, it's the side effect profile because you have less alopecia and less neuropathy.